Welcome, everybody. Today on the show, Jane Hansen. Uh, Jane Hansen is a native of Minnesota, uh, came to uh, New York to join NBC Networks as an anchor in 1979, a winner of nine Emmy Awards. Jane stayed with the network as an anchor and host of Jane's New York through 2006. Today, she helps individuals like me and you to be stronger speakers and make better presentations. I'm excited to have her on the show today. The stuff that that we're going to be talking about and why it's going to be so important to you is, first of all, failing to prepare is preparing to fail, number one. But also, you're going to, you're going to find out how the most important ways to use your body language to persuade and influence others. Jane Hansen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. And it's always fun to talk about this stuff because it's right near and dear to my heart. Yes, yes. Well, you know, it, it, and it's, it's interesting. Uh, body language is something that we do consciously as well as unconsciously. And I think for the most part, it's unconscious, right? I mean, we, we don't know, you know, we don't know what we're communicating because we're not aware of our body language. So uh, let me ask you this. How did you go from a, a Emmy Award winning anchor into a body language expert? Well, it's actually pretty easy because what, what happened was um, I actually went back to NBC for a while and did another show that was, it was celebrity driven. It was a lifestyle show and it was called New York Live and it was, um, you know, Anybody who came through New York came on this program. And after, and, and I discovered one day, because sometimes I would be interviewing people and I've interviewed hundreds of thousands of people in live television situations or taped or whatever. And I realized that they were just merely going along with me when I'd ask them questions without ever getting back to why they were there. Like, let's say they were there to launch a book or talk about a movie or whatever it was. Instead of going back and saying, you got to come see my movie, here's why, they'd be, oh, yes, I, I did do that back in, you know, in the, in the early 2000s. And, and then we get off the show and they'd say, I never got to talk about what I wanted to talk about. And I said, well, whose problem is that? It's not mine. And I realized that there was a business in helping people learn how to share their messages. Yeah. And so that's, and so that therein comes this you know, comes this um, ability to help really hone messages and, and know how to handle not only media interviews, but presentations and speeches and creating videos and all that stuff. Um, but the other thing, then I got really fascinated by body language because I would start to watch all these people that wanted training and I'd watch videos of them. And I realized I was making judgments before they even opened their mouth. Why was I making those judgments? Because of the way they looked or the expression on their face or, or something stupid that they did. And so then I started really looking into it. And I realized you made the point about how it's all subconscious or under, you know, on our second conscious level. Well, if you think about body language, we communicated only through our bodies for most of the time that man has walked on earth. We've only had a spoken language for 160,000 years but we've been walking earth a lot longer than that. So that means that we communicated by so many different means. And if you start to look at it, you can realize it's totally innate and we all understand it and we take things away from it, even though we don't realize it to your point. Yes. Uh, you know, and what's so amazing, uh, I mean, first of all, about what you said uh, about these people who are professional they are intelligent, but yet they fail to get their message across. So it's, it, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, somebody who's unseasoned. I mean, a lot of these people that you interviewed, they've been on the air multiple times. They, they've been on shows. They, uh, they, they are professional uh, authors, speakers, uh, actors, singers, and when, especially when you're doing a live show, when that little light turns on, uh, you can get the most intelligent people, but yet they'll go blank as soon as the light turns on, right? And, and so I could, oh, see, yeah. I could see a lot of people just, you know, they're, the, the light comes on and, and, and yeah, they, they don't, 
as you mentioned, they don't focus on their message and they lose out. Right. Well, some of the people I work with will say, I say, what's your problem? You know, what do you, why are you here? Why do you want to, what do you want to learn? And they'll go, I have brain fog to exactly to your point, the tell, you know, the red light comes on on the TV, or maybe they're, they're introduced in a, you know, giving a speech and all of a sudden they go, why am I here? I forgot what I'm doing. Blah, 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 blah. And they do, they literally have this thing. So I, I, I really, I, I feel really good about helping people get past that. And there are some easy tricks. There really are. All right, so let's talk about some of these easy tricks. What are some easy tricks to master your body language? Specifically, I want you to maybe give us some ideas on how we can master our body language and have it in sync with our words. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, because it's completely disingenuous. If what you're saying doesn't match what you're, what you're doing with your body, everybody knows that you're full of it. They are. They just do. So um, example, if you are talking about something that's really serious and you're smiling your way through it, people are like, who is this phony baloney? Right. Um, or if you're, um, you know, if you're doing something with your hands that don't make sense and people say, well, they don't even know what they're talking about. It, it just robs you of your credibility. But if you use it effectively, it only adds and enhances. So going back to that idea of gestures and using your hand, hands are considered to be like a second language. Most people use them in some way, uh-huh, in our conversations, and they add emphasis when you do it right. But when you don't use them correctly, they're a complete distraction. And you know, it's like when somebody puts their hand in their pocket and, and then they're walking around the stage and you're going, why is your hand in their pocket? And you start to fixate on that versus listening to what they're saying. So it's a great distraction. So we have to just... We have to be careful about it. What I suggest to people is, especially if you're doing a speech or a presentation, build into your, the words you're gonna say, build into that places where maybe you're gonna move on a stage or maybe you're going to pause. When we pause, that's the most underutilized tool that's out there. Pausing enhances our credibility. It makes us seem far wiser and far more, um, authentic than just about anything else we can do. Now, most people are afraid to pause. And when I say pause, it's the length of time it takes to tap your foot. So it's not long, but most people are afraid of it because we don't like silence. Right. Takes a lot of guts to be on a stage or in front of a television camera or on a video that you might be creating to actually take a pause. So, but do it because I'm telling you, it is the single most important thing you can do to be heard and to be listened to. And the other thing is it creates these expectations from your audience. They're, they're all of a sudden they're saying, uh oh, what's this person going to do next? I better pay attention. And you do. Right. Well, you know what? And, and I've heard this from a couple of different speakers, trainers, if you will. And I think this is one of the best ways to use a pause and at the same time deflate that awkwardness, right? And so I've heard several trainers and speakers, a presenter say, you know, they'll ask a question and then they'll say, I'm okay with silence. So you guys think about it and let me know, you know, and, and, and give me your thoughts, right? So mm -hmm. the presenter be, just goes quiet and there's that little tension that builds up before somebody raises their hand and says something. And I, and I think that's so effective because first of all, it, 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 it forces the audience to be more engaged and to mm -hmm. pay attention. Right. Yeah. And at the same oh, yeah. time, it, it kind of, like I said, deflates that awkwardness that sometimes we feel when we go silent. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, I love that. Most speakers are not brave enough to do it because, you know, a couple of reasons they might not want to hear what you have to say. Like maybe you're going to say, man, this sucks. Or, <laughs> but, but the truth is, most of the time, your audience is on your side. They came there to listen to you because you've got some information, you've got some expertise that they want to know about. So they, and they want you to do a good job. They want to be engaged. They want to listen. They want to have fun. They want to learn. So they're not really there to be judgmental. The only time they're judgmental is if you really stink. Right. So, so 
if you, if you, and then they love, everybody loves being asked their opinion. So if you ask them a question and then they come forward and, and find a way to answer it, it's a home run. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I like what you said there. Uh, they're there for a reason. They're there to get information, to be entertained, to walk away with uh, maybe something that they can apply in their lives. So yeah, they're, they're there. I would say 80% of the people in the audience are there voluntarily, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes it's a, you know, sometimes it's a command performance, but then that means they better listen because there's going to be some consequence if they don't. Right, right. All right. So let me ask you this, because I, you know, uh, you talk about words to avoid, especially like in a speaking scenario or some kind of, uh, what do you call it, business lingo, business speaks. You talk about words that you want uh words you should avoid if you want to be credible. Talk about these words. Most of the time, they're little cliche words, like the word just. If you say, I just want you to feel this, it sounds almost derogatory. And it take, again, it kind of diminishes what you're saying. Women in particular have a problem with some words, like the like when you women consistently say "sorry, sorry" or "excuse me, excuse me" when they want to make a point. Now, why they need to do that, I don't know. Like "sorry," but I need to add to this. Why do you say "sorry"? It's it's as if we're making an excuse for not being um, for 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 having a point of view right. or for having an idea. So. We want to think carefully about the words that we use and how they're going to be received. Uh, a few, a few other things are, of course, those crutch words. So, and yeah, what I'm hearing a lot now is people when you ask them a question, they go, "Yeah, no," but I think and it's you're so taken aback by by how ridiculous it sounds. Like you said, "Yeah," then you said, "No," you know, you yeah, you know, ugh. Like yesterday, I was working with somebody and this guy kept saying, I'm down with that. OK, dude. And I said, you're going to half the audience is going to go unless that audience is full of what? Surfers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Surfers. <laughs> otherwise, they're going to be like, oh, <laughs> what is he talking about? So you want to connect with your audience on their level. And that's a really key point. So think about the words that you use for whom your audience is. But those little ones I'm talking about right now, every audience, every audience is not gonna dig those. Right. And, and I think that, uh, uh, I think, <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, I, I think, what do you call it? They're referred to sometimes as non-words. Back to the people mm -hmm. dislike the whole silence thing. So they like try to fill, they're fillers. They're filler words. Thank you. It, fillers, it, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just be comfortable being silent or, uh, you know, just shut up and make your point. Be quiet. And back to what you're saying about the about women saying, excuse me, or, or sorry. I think that's gotten better. But I, I know at one point it was extremely prevalent. And I believe that's because there is this kind of, I don't know where the, how the message was developed or this feeling that, that if you are a woman and you express yourself too directly, that you're going to step on males, fragile egos. And yes, <laughs> males do have fragile egos, <laughs> egos, but I agree. I think, look, if you want to be taken seriously as a female, if you have, um, you know, I think it's okay just to say what you think and let the frail egos deal with it. It's because it's, it's not about you. It's about the frail egos that, you know, that, that are having a problem handling. And, and I, again, I think it's gotten better. The old boys network is starting to break up a little bit. And I think that now you have more women in, in, in CEO positions. You have more women in leadership positions. You have more women in thought leadership positions. So, it's gotten better, but still happens. 
Oh, it does still happen. Another thing that's interesting about women is, and if you're getting back to that body language thing, it's about taking up space. Mm. So women are very quick, and I know you've seen this, in a conference room, for example, they would be the ones who squeeze over to let somebody else in, and so they diminish their size. When they're speaking, they don't use their hands as much. They kind of stay a little inside them, or might they might be the ones that are sitting on the sidelines. I'm always encouraging them to take your space because I guarantee you no guy does that in a the room. They just don't. And so women need to really think about all these different, you know, they're almost like mechanics of, of how to speak well, how to be well, how to be accepted and that kind of thing. I mean, men have their own issues too. Uh, sometimes they, they don't listen very well. Sometimes they will butt in before you finish talking. They'll, um, you know, they'll, 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 because men have deeper voices, which is a whole nother part of this is using our voice properly. They have deeper voices. They're considered instantly more credible. But let women me ask have you this, since you mentioned the deeper voice thing, uh -huh. it reminded me of Elizabeth Holmes, oh. uh, the CEO of Theranos. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So they, they said that, that she purposely dropped her voice to make it deeper. Mm-hmm. And it does, you know, if, if you've ever heard her with her deeper voice, it sticks with you. It, it does. I don't know if it adds any more credibility, but certainly it shocks you at first to hear somebody, to, to, to see a female with such a deep voice. What's your take on that whole thing that she did with her voice? Oh, everything about her seems now in retrospect, seems like it was just completely phony. Right. But I will tell you, when she first was out there and was really in that space and everybody was loving her and saying, oh, my God, this is so remarkable what she's doing. I actually I use a lot of clips in my in my work to show people I would use clips of her to say, listen to her voice. I'm not suggesting you sound like her, but let's think about how we can deepen our voice because it is something women need to do um, to for credibility purposes, because we don't want them to be like this. Blah, blah, blah. We don't want to be sing songy. Right. And some women naturally have a higher voice. So I, I really work on getting it deeper. Now, when I look back on it, I'm thinking, wow, she really set everything up. I mean, it's weird. When you listen to that voice now, it's just weird. Yeah, it is a weird, it is weird, but still it, it was one of the things that made her outstanding. Uh, she set herself apart from other females. She, that voice was so distinctive. And, and, mm -hmm. and again, maybe, maybe as a female, you don't have to go that far, but it is something to look at um, just as a training exercise. Uh, okay, so maybe for our female audience, what are some things that they can do to be to add some credibility? You, you, you talked about the space thing, and so maybe throw that back in there again. But what are some other things that females can do to be more? Uh, what do you call it? Is it? To use their body language in their space better. Okay. So, uh, so again, when we talk about um, women and their voices, one of the things that women do is we have a lot of up inflections. Like if I say, hello, everybody, my name is Jane Hansen. Well, does it sound like I even know my own name? Right? So what an up inflection does is it turns a statement into a question. And women tend to do this a lot. It's a bad habit. Now, psychologically, one of the reasons that we may do it is because we're so pe such people pleasers. We don't want to show that we're the smartest person in the room, even though we know we are. So we do that, add that little up inflection. So it's kind of like, oh, you buy into me. I'm, I'm understanding your problems. Well, it's all a bunch of crap. You got to just forget it. Uh, so get rid of that up inflection. Um, another thing that women do is we have our own, we get rattled in, the, in, in different ways. Another example, when somebody's making a presentation to an audience, when a woman sees somebody that's maybe getting on their phone, she gets, she's like, oh, oh, I'm not being any good. I'm not resonating. They're not listening to me. What am I going to do? And then their, their mind just takes over. A guy, on the other hand, that sees that happening has this response going, Hmm, I must be so good. They're tweeting things out about me. Or 
this dude is missing the biggest, the best speech of his life. So it's two different interpretations of audience behavior. Women need to say, look, I'm not going to please everybody all the time. I cannot focus on that. And they need to shift their attention back to maybe somebody who's a happy face, maybe somebody that's that's looking and watching and listening to them and they're nodding and that sort of thing. So this also gets to the point of really great eye contact. So if you're doing, if you're doing an in-person thing, you really want to make sure that you're directly looking at your audience and you start by you divide the audience into three pieces of pizza. You stare, you look at one audience member or one group of the one piece of the pie straight ahead. And then at the turn of a phrase or the end of a sentence or even a paragraph, not before you turn to one side of the room or you, and you turn to the other side of the room after that. So you want to make sure that you're giving everybody in the audience attention. It keeps them focused. It keeps them watching you. It makes them afraid that you're going to look at them and they're not going to be looking up at the right time. I mean, there's all kinds of psychological things that go on. So that's a really good way of doing, of doing the eye contact. And that's actually for everybody. Sometimes we're afraid of looking at people because we don't want to get their reactions. The other thing is um, you mentioned asking questions before. There is nothing like using rhetorical questions or taking a poll or something like that that establish yourself as somebody who's full of confidence. Unconfident people don't do that. I also talk about strategic movement and walking across a stage or even in a, a conference room or, or something of that sort where you make note in your presentation or in your speech where you're going to make a movement. Strategic movement really helps because it forces people to, again, pay attention. It re-engages them. It's a very simple technique, but you have to do it at a moment where it makes sense in whatever you're saying. So let's say that you start to walk across the stage and you're talking the whole time and all of a sudden you're like a bobblehead and you're going back and forth and back and forth. And people are like, what is this person doing? So again, that's something that if women can, can develop some of these techniques, I mean, they work for men too. It's just that women don't tend to do them as often. Right. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, one of the things that I've noticed um, is that in some cases, uh, I, I, uh, women, uh, especially women who are also moms, uh, like you mentioned, they're, they're people pleasers and they are so used to giving and giving and giving. Mm -hmm. uh, moms are, are notorious for this. And I mean this, I, I mean this uh, it, kind of in a, I don't know, uh, it's good and bad. It's good that they're, that they're givers because that's nurturing your children. That's awesome. But it's also, I think, difficult for a lot of moms to turn that off and say, it's my space now. It's my time now. I'm going to go do something for me. I'm not, you know, I'm going to shut off the, uh, the giving nurture side for a couple hours. And sometimes these moms, when they get to the office or back to the office environment, they're, they're on that people pleasing mom giving mode. Mm -hmm. And I think it becomes detrimental. I think you're right. I mean, it's one. So what's been interesting during the pandemic is a lot of the work that I've been doing with CEOs and you know, top level executives is all about helping them learn how to be more compassionate and more vulnerable, which by the way, women tend to have in spades, but we also might carry that too far. And so there is, there's a nice, there, there's a kind of a, a middle road, a middle ground that we should probably try to stick to, which is I don't have to please everybody. And I don't have to always be sure that everybody in the room is happy because they're never going to be. And all it does is, again, take something away from me. So we just need to be conscious of what we're doing and when we're doing. I mean, there's so many layers to all of this. And sometimes if you get if you start digging really deep into it, you just get overwhelmed. But I do. Um, I appreciate that women really care. I yes. really do. And God knows we need more of that in today's world. Yes, and absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's really being probably more intentional 
I think it's the way in which to, in the way in which to deal with this properly is to be really intentional about what you're doing, what you've got in your mind when you're going into a meeting, how you're going to treat people, the points that you want to accomplish, and make sure you accomplish it. Yes, I like that. All right. So uh, the uh, what's the what's the word I'm looking for? That the, there's I don't know if it's a myth. Maybe it's a strategy that that there's a specific way to start a meeting and a specific way to end a meeting. Talk about your, your, your take on this. Well, again, this is something else that really came to mind and was really emphasized during the pandemic and when everybody was doing things on Zoom or some other kind of media platform. And so at the very beginning, I like to call it having a virtual handshake because we couldn't shake people's hands in person any longer. And what I mean by that is starting a meeting by actually finding a way to connect with your audience by asking them questions. Just as, I mean, if you think about it logically in person, you can shake hands, you can talk to people about, oh, I see that picture of your kid in your office or something that's in the conference room or something that happened on the way to the meeting or whatever it is, um, or in, and, and this, but it's, it's about, how do I actually help people connect with me at the beginning? And you have to do that because in today's world, we are so more expecting something to be interactive, something to really make us feel like we are wanted to be part of this presentation or part, you know, part of the audience. Um, What I do when I'm, when I'm actually at an in-person event where I've got several, you know, maybe a hundred, a couple hundred people in a presentation or 50, whatever it is, whatever the number is, I will get there a little bit early and I'll talk to people ahead of time so I can find something out from them that I can insert into my presentation, whatever it is. You know, sometimes it's somebody's having a birthday that day, or maybe it's that, uh, maybe something about the weather or a commute or a, a joke that I'm going around, or maybe there's something in the news that day that has to do with whatever, whatever is um, happening with that particular company or organization or group or kind of people. Um, or maybe it's something funny, but you got to be careful about the funny stuff because sometimes I've seen lots of jokes fall flat. So you got to know your audience well before you tell a joke. <laughs> but the other thing I want to tell people is, you know, you can use the same material over and over and over again. And the reason I say that is because you've always got a different audience for the most part. So they haven't heard it. It's like comics. Comics are wonderful people to observe for the way to really make your presentation sing. Comics are telling the same jokes night after night after night after night. But every time they do it, they make it sound like they just thought it up. So you have to get to the place where whatever you're presenting or talking about, you too can make it as exciting the 90th time you're saying it as the first time. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the, again, best speakers that I know, best trainers that I know, you could pick up their book or you could pick up their their audio files or whatever their audios. And when you go and see them live, the content is 95% the same as their book or their audio course or their training course. They don't change it a whole lot they, they, and they don't need to. In some cases you have to update it, sure, but at least 80% is going to be the same content. And I think part of that actually adds to your credibility because oh, yeah. you know, if, if you're saying something that is, I'll use the word truth, then mm-hmm it's not going to deviate that much. Absolutely. And it works. They wouldn't be there and they wouldn't have success. They had if it didn't work and you don't want you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but if you've got tried and true principles and practices that actually help people become really good at this, there is nothing to me, like nothing so exciting for me than to actually have somebody who came to me and said, I've got, you know, the, 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 the aforementioned brain fog when I get in front of a speech or make a presentation or I've got this or I've got that. And when I can actually get them to a point where all of a sudden they've gone from dreading making presentations or dreading uh, doing interviews to loving it, that makes my 
day, month, year. I mean, I love that because it shows that this stuff works. And it's a lot of it's really simple, but it's also the other thing I see is that people don't spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff. They don't worry about how they're communicating when communication is probably the most important thing that's going on in their life on a daily basis. When we've got a bad golf swing, we go take golf lessons. When we want to play the piano, we take piano lessons. When we, um, you know, almost anything else in life, we, we think, how can I make this better? But when it comes to communication, we didn't think about it. And then we wonder why we're not doing such a great job. Yes, no, absolutely true. Uh, and I love the fact that you point out it's it's what we do 24-7. Mm-hmm. If we're not communicating verbally, we're communicating with our body language, right? Exactly. Uh, so, so we're doing it all the time. Uh, okay, so that's how to start a meeting. What about ending a meeting? What's your well, strategy for that? You need to have a call to action. Why are you there? Are you there because you want to persuade somebody to do something? Are you there because you want to... Um, sell something? Are you there because it's, it's, um, you want to, whatever it is, you need you, whatever your reason for being there is you have to tell people at the end, what you expect from them. So many times I see somebody end up with a, and that's how it is. Questions. And you're going, you gotta be kidding. Like, tell me how I can to move this forward. Tell me what you expect from me. So you have to have that call to action. And I always believe it's important to tie it back to how you started. Be that maybe you have an agenda at the beginning. Today, we're going to discuss how we need to make a decision about X, Y, or Z. At the end, you say, all right, you've heard all the points. What's our decision? Or you have, you know, now you're going to take all this information back. You're going to put it into your head and we will have to make a decision by tomorrow at noon. I mean, just make it really super clear, because if you don't, then why'd you bother? Right. No, I I love that. I love that. Uh, It it gives them something to think about as they leave. And and, Mm -hmm. and if it's if if, if it's, uh, let's say, a new technique that you want them to uh, implement, then, yeah, hey, this is what you got to do next for the next two days is what we're doing, whatever, whatever. I like it. It's great. It's simple. Very. All right. So. Let me ask you this, uh, because we're short on time. Um, What are some of the things that you've learned from TV that will help everyday people be more successful? Well, the most important thing is how to listen. You have two ears and one mouth for a reason. So learn to listen. And I am telling you that if you listen to people, They will walk away from a conversation with you thinking you are the coolest person in the whole world. You may, they may not have asked you one question about yourself. They know nothing more about you, but you know a lot about them and they know that you've listened. So that's, that's one key. I mean, I used to do, you know, interviews and I would have a set bunch of questions that I was going to ask based upon my research, based upon whomever, whatever the subject was. But sometimes those questions went right out the door because somebody would say something really interesting. And I'm like, that's what my audience needs right now. And so I would go take them down that path. So listening provides you with so much. So listening is crucial. Uh, Again, using your body in ways that will get people to know that you care. You know, that old adage, I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. That's really important. I think um, being very flexible and adaptable I means sometimes you have to change things up at the last moment. Sometimes you walk into a place and instead of having a 20, 20 minutes for a speech, you've got 10 or 20 minutes, you've got an hour. So always think in terms of how can I, how can I kind of move things around and be really adaptable to any situation? Uh, Cause that's certainly what happened in television all the time. We, there's finite amounts of time. And then respect your audience. Respect that you're giving them information, allow them to make their own decisions and judgments. There's not enough of that that happens today. We try to tell people what to think, but we need to respect them and say, here's, you make the decision about what you want to feel about this. I'm just giving you all the pertinent facts. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. All right, so here's my final question. Because I think you probably get this a lot 
I know that uh, this comes up quite a bit. So how do you calm the nerves, uh, that monkey brain? How do you shut it down when you have to give an important presentation? Maybe you have to give an important presentation to investors or to the boss or, you know, it's, maybe it's your first big break as a speaker and you're in front of whatever, 100 people or 1,000 people. How do you calm yourself down? Well, you started at the beginning with saying failing to prepare is preparing to fail, which is a Winston Churchill quote. And so the first thing is good prep. Know what you want to say, practice it, have it in your head. So, you, so, you, so there's nothing that can make you look like a deer in the headlights. Second, something really important that we do, I don't know, how, how many thousands of times a day, it's called breathing. So what I want you to do is to do this simple little exercise. You breathe in for three counts, you hold it for three counts, you breathe out for three counts, and you do it three times. And what this does, and nobody ever has to know you're doing it, what it does is it really calms us down. It, 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 we breathe into our diaphragm by doing that, which naturally makes our voices be more resonant. So that really helps. And then the third thing is, I want you to focus on your purpose. And this is really key for women. There've been a number of studies that have been done that shows if we focus on why we're there versus, oh, my hair, oh, my dress, oh, my this, oh, my that. If we focus on the purpose, because that's what the audience wants. Right. Then it suddenly becomes, we suddenly kind of get out of our own head. So preparation, breathing, purpose. I love that. I love that. And a personal story I remember doing my first one minute video, this is years ago, and it was like, it's just a one minute video and I have it somewhat scripted out and it's going on hour number two and it's driving me crazy. And, and then uh, I, I forgot how I got that information that you just mentioned, start focusing on your audience, start focusing on why you're there. And once I started focusing on why I was there, what, you know, versus how I looked and how I sounded, and I really focused on trying to help my audience, the nerve things went away. I got the, I got the one minute video done in like 58 seconds. And anyway, the rest is history, but it, it does work when you focus on them or your purpose and what, and, and it makes a huge difference. It does. It's like magic. One other thing I just want to add is remember, it's just a conversation. Mm, I like that. Yeah. All right. So, Jane, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, if somebody's saying, man, I need to get some help, where's the best way or what's the best website to reach you at? My website, which is basically just Jane Hansen, H-A-N-S-O-N.com. And there's a place in there where you can reach out to me. Um, and it also has my email on there and all that good stuff. And the email is really simple too. It's Jane at janehansen.com. Very simple, very easy to remember. Jane Hansen, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. You told me to have, that we had to have a good time and I hope we've accomplished that mission. Uh, I think so too. I had a lot of fun. I've learned some new strategies.